So we, Phil and Stephen and I have uh, decided to once a month try and convene on Zoom to discuss two movies, which I think we're just sort of uh, going to throw each other's suggestions out there and we'll come up with a couple. I mean, maybe we'll see how tonight goes. Maybe we'll realize we can do more than two. I don't know. But two's, pro two's probably a good number to start with. Yeah. So um, Phil had, I think, suggested these first two. One was a movie I recommend to you some time back. That's uh, The Sunshine Makers, a documentary about uh, the production of LSD in the 60s, the people who produced a lot of it. And mm -hmm. uh, the movie Shirley with Elizabeth Moss. So personally, I'll just say I obviously was the one who saw The Sunshine Makers first. I think I saw it a couple of years ago on Canopy and then I did watch it again and uh, I had not seen Shirley uh, before you recommended it so that one is just uh, I only watched that about three days ago so those I are actually the two, two we're going to discuss yeah I hadn't seen Shirley when I recommended it I'd only seen it about <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes but it was one of the more prominent films of last year and it's one that we hadn't talked about in the other discussion so it seemed like a good choice and we are all Mad Men fans so that's all I'd say. So that's how we think of Elizabeth Moss is we're Mad Men fans, so we like her. <laughs> What's Whatever that? happened to West Wing? Is she in West Wing? She was the president's daughter in West Wing. Okay. Oh, wow. You know, it's I, funny. I just, uh, not 10 minutes ago or 15 or 20 minutes ago, I started, I checked to see if there was an ILX thread on her. There wasn't. So I started one and I misspelled her name in the title. I spelled it with a Z. And right away, somebody oh. pointed out. Now, the good thing is on ILX, uh, titles can be changed. So somebody fixed it for me. But I didn't know about the West Wing. So no, I, I didn't know about it. that either. I've been meaning to watch that show for years, actually. So. Also, do you know the, the series Top of the Lake? Somebody um, mentioned that in the thread. Yeah, it's New Zealand, I think, or Australia. It's uh, Jane Campion, it might be. But Jane Elizabeth Campion. Moss is the star of that. So that's the TV, TV series she does. I looked her up a few weeks ago. Something prompted me to look her up, what she'd been doing. And she did not like nothing for a decade. And she was doing a TV series. And that must be the one. Yeah, to, don't hold me to that. But I, it's been a while. But I think that's that's hers. That's, yeah. uh, what's her name? From the Holly Hunter's in there. Okay. Other people, a lot of, hey, is that guy's in there. But Elizabeth Moss is the main character. So, uh, Sunshine Makers, um, you know, I'll start. I liked it. Um, I didn't love it. I gave it a 6.5 on my little movie, ongoing movie ratings. Um, you know, I, I, it's hard to say where to begin. I guess you begin with the two guys, right? What you thought of the, the two main guys, um, Tim Scully and uh, Nick Sam. Sand. Nick Sand. Nick Sand. Nick Sand. Nicholas Sand. And um, I liked them both. Nicholas Sam was funny. You know, he had this kind of, you know, he's arrogant, but it was engaging. You know, it wasn't a turnoff. He's certainly kind of full of himself in contrast to Tim Scully, who was very soft-spoken. One of the women referred to him, said they thought he might have a touch of Asperger's. I didn't get that because, you know, I, I over my years of teaching, I taught two or three kids that were on the milder end of Asperger's and he wasn't like them. He seemed soft-spoken. He may have in his eating habits had some obsessive compulsion things, but he didn't strike me at all as having any Asperger's. I don't know. Maybe when he was younger, cause he was that obsessive sort of chemist sort of guy, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Yes, I think the obsessiveness is, is what impresses you if you're not obsessive. I guess so. But I mean, that means I have a touch of it too, because I'm obsessive about all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know that much about Asperger's. So I didn't really, I took, I, I've heard that comment and it registered with me, but I didn't really know what to make of it. So, yeah. 
uh, well, uh, so that's my overall impression. What about you guys? Well, I, I would expand on that. I liked the movie more than you did, and I think more than Stephen did, too. I saw Stephen's uh, brief write-up on Letterboxd. Uh, okay, I didn't check any of that because um, I'm going to go in this cold. Okay, I don't know why I was really taken by it. Um, and I think the main reason I liked it so much was I liked almost every single person in the movie to some degree. There wasn't anyone whose screen time... I didn't enjoy the one the one guy I'm, I'm glad I'm glad they didn't have more of him but he was interesting was the one sort of hippie-ish guy he was a bit of a cartoon character in some ways Mike Mike who was it Mike? I think his name is Mike or Michael uh, I can't remember his name so the real the guy who's the real like almost even more than Nick Sandy like he's still obviously a drug enthusiast and you know the guy with the really long hair and like yeah wearing the, oh, is that his name? Somebody, okay yeah. okay and he was interesting too, but he's the one guy, it's like, okay, you probably wouldn't want too much of him in a movie necessarily. Mm -hmm. But even like the two, um, like the two narcotics agents or yeah, whatever, I, I, like just, them too. I found them really interesting and yeah. likable and smart. Um, yeah. The one guy, especially, I wrote his name down actually, Patrick Clark. He mm -hmm. was just really engaging to listen to. And I love the women, like they were really interesting as well. So there I just thought two, like, yeah. well, there were two, two, two that were, two that were in there on a fairly recurring basis. It was kind of weird because with um, like Nick Sand was obviously the one who had all these, like he was really into women and all that stuff. He was real, he, real hedonist, that guy. But the one, like one point in the movie, they mentioned something about like his fourth wife or something. And then she makes an appearance right near, not until the end though, which was just kind of odd. Like the other women, sort of were in there more frequently talking about the time frame and then all of a sudden they introduced sort of this other one but so the two ones who sort of showed up fairly yeah. recurringly were I found them really interesting and that's the main thing that it boiled down to for me is that I just found all these people and their stories really believable really compelling um, it's obviously a kind <laughs> of a, a pro LSD movie I think I don't think it makes any bones about that but it doesn't present <laughs> those agents or anything in a bad in a doesn't try and make them be you know be evil critters or anything like that I thought one technique I'll just point out too that I found really interesting and maybe they've done this in other documentaries but sometimes they would have one person talking about another person and they'd have the person being talked about on on camera now obviously they weren't hearing what the person was yeah. saying about them so they weren't responding to it but I just found it a kind of interesting device. They did that a few times with Scully in particular. They'd show his face while Nick Sand was talking. I, I thought they did him. it more with Sand almost, yeah. Oh, did they maybe? Okay. I could be wrong, but I know the technique. I've seen it elsewhere, but they did use it a lot. In this okay, film. okay. So that's my, you know, and then there's music and stuff. But what did, what did you what did you think, Stephen? I, I did read <laughs> your, your review, so I know a little bit of what you had in mind. So I... Uh... I didn't expect it would be a movie that wasn't really for me, but because I thought, oh boy, drugs, sixties. But <laughs> it it wasn't what I wanted to see. Which again, that's not the fault of the movie. That's just me bringing an expectation. Um, it was about those two guys. It was about the the other people in the in the scenes, and as you say, they were good. I love those two cops who didn't ever come across as uh, virulent anti drug guys. They just mm -hmm. did their job. And I appreciated that. Um, and I, I questioned to myself, why hadn't I really heard of these two guys before? Because clearly they had some import in inventing one of the more famous brands of acid. And I didn't even know who they were. So on that level, uh, it's informative for me. Um, it didn't ever make me feel like I was back there taking acid. And maybe that's irrelevant. But it's what I was looking for. I know that much. And um, I don't know how I would do different if I were writing history or making a, a documentary about the history. There's no question how important Orange Sunshine was. But I think I mentioned when I wrote about it, uh, eventually the, the names were more, they were brand names, but they weren't necessarily the real thing. So you, if you were dealing it, you wanted to say this is Orange Sunshine, but it wasn't Orange Sunshine. You just wanted someone to take it. And even if it was Orange Sunshine, it was cut or something. So um, that, that just seemed seemed a bit of an exaggeration. But so what? Really, it was interesting. It was about something very specific. 
um, I I really wanted to learn more about the entire scene, and uh, and as as the movie went on, I realized it was about those two guys, and the general uh, manufacturing of the drug. So that's why I say I'm looking for something maybe that they didn't intend to make. When I say, well, what about uh, when they had this happened and this happened that wasn't specific to what those two guys were doing? That's funny the way that you uh, frame that. I think that your problem with that is probably literally exactly the same problem I had the first time I saw Dazed and Confused. You know, that moment is so close to me that I had a movie in my mind already. <laughs> and, and, you know, that was his version in 1975. It wasn't mine, which is dumb because why would he, why would he go out and film my version of 1975, right? Um, and, and over time, I really grew to like the film. I just had this really dumb, locked in with this really dumb, pre I'm not saying you're, that, that's the wrong word. I don't mean yours is dumb, Stephen. What I mean is we walk in with these preconceived notions, right? And I, you were right there in the moment. That was one of the questions I was gonna ask you actually. Did you ever have an encounter? You've already answered it. Did you ever ever have an encounter with either, either of those two guys? Yeah, I didn't know who they were. Uh, Osley was, uh, everybody knew Osley, not personally, but we all knew him. And he was a brand name of his own. His, his name was the brand. And of course, as related to music, when that dries up, he becomes the Griffith sound man and builds all those enormous racks of amps and everything. So he had other fame besides, besides acid. Yeah, I mean, it didn't exactly match my my experiences because um, the first time I took acid, I was 16, but that was like 69 or 70. So we're already moved past most of the period of the movie in terms of when it was still legal and when uh, Orange Sunshine came along. And also this probably relates to my, my desire for something else. I wanted to be a hippie so bad. I grew up like 30 miles from San Francisco, but it might as well have been 300 miles because I wasn't going to get to be a hippie. I just wanted to be. When I listened to these, I took drugs, and eventually I got to even better drugs. Um, so that's what I wanted to be. And maybe in that sense, I wanted this movie to be more of that. I mentioned in my thing, the movie Magic Trip, which has a, a bunch of problems on its own, but it's a movie about and featuring the Mary pranksters and that's when i think about that time that's who i think about the peter fonda film right Excuse no me? i don't think so no did you say the trip no Not no trip. Alex it's, a documentary. it's more a documentary about the merry pranksters right i said that's on canopy also i think i did watch that one oh, around the same time the as the makers. it's very good also actually it's certainly in terms of how it was made, if you followed the existence of this footage of the pranksters going across the country on a bus, filming everything, not syncing the sound, not caring, they were all fucked up anyway, they didn't give a shit, the movie sat around for decades, no one could do anything with this thing, and so we settled for little snippets, and then all of a sudden these two people, they said, oh, okay, we can do this, and they they didn't, they, they put uh, interviews on someone like, something like what we saw in uh, this movie, but they didn't actually interview anybody new. They just took a lot of the sound recordings from the same time. And instead of trying to sync them, you see some, something happening and then you hear somebody talking about when it happened. Uh, it, it almost looked like it was on purpose instead of just, they turned an incredible mess into something. That's sort of like that. that. Sort of like the yeah. Beatles film I saw last year about them in India. And the sole reason for that film seemed to be that they had all this footage, you know? Mm -hmm. And well, we got to make a movie. Um, and they did, they cobbled it together with some modern uh, current interview footage and did what they could. Um, I think I answer, you know, I was trying to figure out, you both sort of answer one of my questions, I think which was why did they, it threw me that they told the story out of order. You start with these two guys in 1969, it's going along. And then all of a sudden they back up to 1966. 
and to, so they can get you back to the point where you started. And I, I guess if they'd started in 66, you start with Owsley and then it becomes about acid, but it was about these two guys. So you almost, uh, I think they decided we've got to introduce them first. Um, that's our movie. And then we'll back up as to how uh, Scull uh, Scully, right? How Scully got to where he was. So that was kind of interesting. I was actually wondering if, if Scully was a, was an inspiration for the character Scully on the X Files. I never really watched the X Files. Crossed my mind too. With, with the chem, with the chemistry angle, you never know, right? Yeah. So, um, Stephen, that's very interesting what you said about. Um, so you don't mind me saying? I think I think you're exactly ten years older than me. You were born in '54, right? '53. Yeah. Oh, '53. Okay, so you're like eleven years older than me, and I guess. Uh, Eight, eight or seven eight years, years older than Phil. Time, yeah. um, your your point about how you so badly wanted to be a hippie, um, and that that whole thing I think lingered. You know, that's kind of I think what they call Generation X a little bit too, right? But I do remember, like for me, it was a little later. Obviously, it was more like the and, and different context, but early seventies and mid seventies. Um, I always had this this sort of not a chip on my shoulder but this thing like like damn I missed like all this really great stuff and you know you were getting fed like you know and people like Bangs and Marcus would mock this stuff you're always getting like the 60s sort of thrown at your face and tv shows mm -hmm. and all this stuff and news news real footage and all that but I was always so intrigued by it and I think that sort of um, did sort of play into just my interest in drug culture in general I just I always kind of yearned for it when I was younger. I mean, I was kind of scared of drugs when I, at first, when I became of the age to took, take them. And I, I waited till a little later in life or whatever to actually get into them. But I remember even what, and this is going later, but watching, um, when you say about a movie that kind of, like you wanted something that kind of immersed you in the drug culture. One movie I found, a documentary that kind of did a good job of that for me believe it or not, was the movie called It Was 20 Years Ago Today about the making of Sgt. Pepper. You can imagine when that played on TV in June 1987. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching it and recording it. And in, in essence, that movie is not just about the Beatles. It's about LSD. They really push the LSD angle in that mm -hmm. movie. I think that you hit on something. Um, it's not that the movie isn't about LSD um, and the guys who are making it, they're not just making it for the money. They're not just making it because they have an interest. They want to change the world. So in that sense, it's about the experience of LSD because you take this once and then you make everybody else take it and everybody's going to be where they are at. So in that sense, it was about it, but it, and we've seen too many of those, uh, you mentioned the trip, Roger Corman, where this is, this person's on acid and then the, they use a bunch of crazy camera angles and stuff and it's totally irrelevant. They didn't do any of that in this movie. But what I never felt I got in this movie was that feel of somebody who was on a trip and going like, whoa. So that we understood more than just in a verbal sense why these guys thought they were going to change the world with this drug they invented. Because they never really gave it a, a, anything, I don't know if concrete's the word, but you, you could watch that whole movie and not know why anybody really wanted it. And, can we and take a second off. out? Can we take Who a second? That? Can we take a second out to uh, commemorate the greatest acid trip on film um, ever? Roger Sterling, okay. Mad Men? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to be a hippie right at the beginning of the 70s, but I think by the middle of the decade, my aspiration, honestly, was to be a real 70s burnout, which I really? wasn't. I was too, <laughs> I was too good in school, you know. I couldn't, I couldn't be what I wanted to be. I would wear plaid shirts. I That's why you're such a Neil Young fan. Better That's it. Than... <laughs> that was that was what I aspired to be, to be that guy on tonight's on the cover of tonight's the night. Wow. <laughs> That's just like you, I'd miss the hippie thing. I wasn't, you know, that wasn't going to happen. That was well in the past, but this was within my grasp. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. You mentioned you mentioned a favorite uh, LSD movie. 
the one I like to go back to is uh, it's on YouTube. And it's, I don't know, maybe 25 minutes long. It's a, it's a taping of an experiment back when it was still legal and they were trying to figure out what to do. And uh, forget his name. Now, one of the famous guys who were testing it out, it's this normal 50s housewife. She even says, I'm normal, aren't I? And and, yeah, I guess you're normal. (laughs) And her husband worked in the same building as where they were doing the testing. So she said, you know, I think I'll do this. Otherwise, she's just your nice, normal lady. And then she drinks some acid. They put it in the drink. And we watch her over the course of those 20 minutes or so. Obviously, it took hours to do. And she's amazing. When you watch that, you really want to do it because... (laughs) Her whole life seems to be changing right before our eyes. Wow. At one point, she says, I wish I could talk in technicolor. It doesn't make any sense, but it does make a lot of sense in a way. I love that movie, and I love that woman. And no one knows whatever happened to her. People want to know. You know, she's probably 90 by now. Well, how did she turn out? Nobody knows. Send, send, a link to, send a link to that. It sounds amazing. Sounds okay. good. I think the first acid trip on film I saw was on TV. It was Go Ask Alice. Mm. Oh. At the party where they play button button. And they're using a I didn't know it at the time. It's a non, it's a cover of White Rabbit. <laughs> uh-huh. They've got all these well known songs That's and great. they're all covers. <laughs> they, they didn't even, you know, instead of even seeking out permission, they just got some house band to wow. do Always It Ain't Easy and uh, White Rabbit and uh, other famous songs. Do you want to talk a bit about the music, Phil? Or yeah, I mostly I wanted to just slip that in there. in there. Yeah, so I could say I've got the list here, but I, I that Taj Mahal I posted is just, I think that is just great. That so caught me off guard, you know, because I'm listening to it and I go, I know that song, but it's nothing like the monkeys version. And then when I realized what it was, and then to realize it was by somebody I knew, I only have one Taj Mahal album, but um What's he the title it, of that song again, Phil? Take a Giant Step. Right, yeah. He I didn't it, know the song before, so. Yeah, he does it totally differently, but not really. He doesn't lose the song. It's just really beautiful. I love that. And uh, what else is in there? No, I was, that was great. I didn't know the song before by the Monkees or, or that version, so it was a new song to me. The other thing that caught my attention was, and I thought this was really strange, it kind of worked, but they used two or three songs I classify as disco. Oh, really? Yeah. And then here I looked at, I looked up the soundtrack. Uh, just let me switch over. I think, I, yeah, I still have it up here. Um, and I think they would probably be, wasn't Simon, C-Y-M-A-N-D. Oh, yeah. Simon, Simonde. 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 I'm familiar band. with him. Um, Lady sounds like they were a disco band. Um, and there was, now there was a Parliament song. They're not really disco. That's, but, but that uh, was more of sort of soul. That was like early 70s yeah. soul, I think. And I missed this. Maybe Stephen caught it. Uh, there was one chocolate watch band song buried in there called Expo 2000. I do remember the Simonde song now that you mention it. I mean, I guess disco, I think, is maybe a little bit of a stretch, maybe. I mean, I think it's more that 70s kind of funk sort of thing leading yeah. into disco, maybe. I mean, disco's but... drug is cocaine, right? It just seemed really weird. Yeah, um, the timing would seem weird, too, if it was... Yeah, and then they had a couple standards, Sunny. But what they didn't use, other than maybe the Chocolate Watch Band, which I miss, they didn't use the cliched songs that you would ex- have expected them to use, most of which are probably very expensive. You know, I'm sure licensing White, uh, White Rabbit or Sunshine Superman has cost you a lot of money. Actually, the it was better um, for that, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I think yeah, that's basically what I'm saying that they avoided that trap of using songs that you'd heard 10 million times. I thought the um, the sunny scene would have been a standout scene in the movie, but I'm not, I'm sort of I like the song, but I don't love it. It reminded me a lot, though, Phil. I don't think you'll you'll know this, Stephen, I could be wrong, but there's a movie that Phil and I both like called um, Dream Tower. It's about the story of Rochdale College in Toronto. But we're going to have to, oh, we got 10 minutes. Now, and um, That film you would like, Stephen. I wish I, I if, God, I, I figure out a way for you to watch Rochdale? that. Rochdale? Well, Rochdale. the film's called Dream Tower. It's about Rochdale. Dreamdale. Dream Tower. Dream, Dream Tower. Tower. Yeah. 
But what I was going to say, if, that's okay. It was, so it was very reminiscent to me of um, the friend and friend and lover scene because it's right. <laughs> they play Sunny right at the sort of at the peak of the sort of optimism around the drug and stuff like that. And they yeah. actually, it's it's a very good montage. I think it is an excellent scene. It's not my favorite <laughs> favorite song in the world, um, but I did think it was of all the music scenes. I thought it was the most. Um, like clearly intended to have big impact or something. So I thought it, I thought they actually did a very good job. They did a lot of intercutting of of stuff, um, and I think they played a fair bit of the song. It was very prominent on the soundtrack. And yeah, it was right at that moment where, you know, we're going to change the world, and you know, we've we've got the labs now. We've sort of figured out how to produce this stuff, and then you get what's the artist name? Bobby? Is it Bobby Hebb? Bobby Hebb, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I can see that comparison. I guess I just have never been crazy about that song. Yeah, it's not but my favorite Friend song. Friend and Lover is one of my favorite songs. So the gap between those two songs. No, but I agree. You're right. the, I agree. The way yeah. they're used is comparable. 